1 and 12 30. Okay. Hey guys, I got a quick question.
down to San Francisco? Yep. And how long do you think this voyage is going to take? Probably about two years. The Mini Boat Program from the Columbia River Maritime Museum is a robust education program that has now educated over 1,200 students in both the United States and Japan. We challenge the students to cooperatively design, build, launch, and then track a GPS-enabled autonomous sailboat with the hopes that it will cross the Pacific Ocean. Each class in the United States builds two boats. One is to be launched from the coast of North America, and the other I personally take over to Japan and hand over to their partner class. This program is teaching kids way more than just building a boat. This is STEAM, this is science, technology, engineering, art, and math, all wrapped into one with an international relations element. They're learning so many different skills and they're learning what that value can bring back to their own life. We learned teamwork and perseverance. It was fun to be kind of hands-on. There are so many different learners in a classroom that we can engage all 30 students with this one tool. But what I think makes a mini boat extra special is it's all hands-on, and the students get to make every decision themselves. The quartermaster department studies ocean currents and weather patterns to look for the most perfect spot to launch their mini boat. The keel department has one of the most important jobs. If their mini boat flips upside down and that keel is not engineered perfectly, their mini boat won't ride up and continue on its voyage. The sail department and the deck department have complete creative control of what that mini boat's going to look like. If it's facing this way and that sail is pointing that way, it won't get sun at all. Kids are strengthening skills. They also are learning about new skills and really opening their minds. Really it's the value we get back when these young people who as fifth graders learned how to do international relations, they learned how to work on teams and projects, they built their confidence and a few years later they're going to be in high school challenging themselves more than they might have otherwise and then they're going to enter the workforce. We're trying to invest in the future. As a mini-boat program, we're actually preparing students for future careers. We're letting them try out all these different jobs and see where they fit best. It's important for Pacific Power to be involved in the mini-boat program because of the enriching value that this program brings to students to stimulate curiosity, to kind of think outside the classroom box. These are all the same types of skills that our employees need to have to be successful in this business. It's our responsibility and opportunity to invest in changing the way that we educate like we see in this Mini Boats program where kids just get engaged and when kids are engaged, they succeed. They want to come to school, they want to accomplish great things and these programs show them that they can. To hear parents and teachers say that they've seen their students transform in the year that the Mini Boat was in their classroom, I think is the greatest compliment to the program. I hope this program does help students to start thinking about their future and what kind of career they might want. And for some of these students, if they choose to stay close to home, I think it's wonderful for them to learn about some of the things they could do right here. Hopefully when they see these boats and they see the videos of them sailing away, they think, I built that. I built a boat that sailed across the Pacific Ocean when I was in fifth grade. The physical boats themselves are small but the voyages they go on are mighty. The students who build them are small, but the things they accomplish when they come together are mighty. Ahoy there, crewmates. Isn't today just a beautiful day for a boat launch? We're so glad you tuned in today to be on this adventure with us. First off, let me introduce myself. I'm Elisa Dunlap, Pacific Power's Regional Business Manager for the North Coast of Oregon. 
That means I get to keep our local communities apprised of what Pacific Power is doing, programs we have to offer, and ways we can partner with you. In this school year, I've had the pleasure of working with our friends from the Columbia River Maritime Museum on its amazing mini boat program. If you're not familiar with this program, students design and build a five foot sailboat that will sail across the Pacific. Along the way, they get to make friends overseas. That's because there are two boats that are built. One is launched here in North America and the other is launched in Japan. The goal is to have each boat reach each other's shores. The students are in charge of this project from engineering the boat's keel, designing the sail, posting videos to social media. All of these are part of STEAM learning. You've probably heard that term before. It stands for science, technology, engineering, the arts, and math. Well, you're probably wondering, why are we here today? Why are we launching a boat? Well, it turns out one of this year's boats built by White East Middle School in Vancouver, Washington, washed ashore about five days after it was launched from the Pacific. The students really wanted to give this boat a second chance. So today we're gonna relaunch their boat in the Columbia River near Vancouver, Washington and watch it as it sails to Astoria. When it reaches Astoria, it will be relaunched in the Pacific and will be on its way across the Pacific in hopes to reach Japan. What's really awesome about this second chance opportunity is that it really shows what STEAM learning is all about. Trying, failing, learning from those mistakes and trying again. That's why we at Pacific Power are so excited to be part, part of this program. We really see students building the type of skills that will be useful no matter what type of career they decide to pursue in the future. Like you, I haven't left my house very much in the last couple of months, which is why this boat launch is just so exciting. So let's take a moment to greet some of the other people that will be on this live stream with us today. First, we're gonna head over to the Columbia River Maritime Museum and meet Nate Sandal. Nate Sandal is the Columbia River Maritime Museum's Education Director, and he's been captaining this program since its inception in 2017. Ahoy, Nate. Hey, Lisa, thank you so much. And thank you, Pacific Power, for all of your support. I want to welcome all the mini boat students and all of our mini boat fans. We're broadcasting live from the Bricks Maritime Hall at the Columbia River Maritime Museum. Great. Thanks, Nate. Next up, we're going to actually go out to the tugboat who will be launching our mini boat today. So today we have Y East Middle School teacher, Mr. Boken. Ahoy, Mr. Boken. Columbia River Riser Shipyard Memorial, where Liberty ships were launched back in 1942. It is a beautiful day out here in Vancouver, Washington on the Columbia River. We are looking forward to a great launch. Thanks, Mr. Boken. Next, we get to meet some of our student shipbuilders. They're going to share with us the process of what it was like building one of these boats. First off, ahoy to Brooklyn. Thank you. Hi, my name is Brooklyn Howard. I am a seventh grader at YES Middle School. And this year I was a part of the mini boat program as a quartermaster. Thanks, Brooklyn. Next over, ahoy to Sean. Um, hello, my name is Sean. I was also a part in the seventh grade Weiss mini boat program, and I was a part of the cargo tracker team. Thanks, Sean. We're looking forward to hearing from both you and Brooklyn later. Um, well, I can assure you we're in for a real treat today. So let's set sail. Nate, over to you. All right. Well, welcome back to the Columbia River Maritime Museum, the Bricks Maritime Hall. And I'm here today to answer you a question. What is a mini boat? So a mini boat is a five foot long fiberglass boat kit that we get from a group called Educational Passages. Um, a gentleman named Dick Baldwin in 2008 came up with the idea of building a small 
autonomous sailboat that is tracked via GPS because his wife was sick of him sailing all by himself out through the ocean. In 2013, he created Educational Passages, and in 2017, while I was at a symposium teaching other teachers all about ROV or remotely operated vehicles, I looked over to the side and laying in the corner, I saw the most magical, beautiful thing. And it turns out it's called a mini boat. Before I even left the parking lot of that symposium, I was on the phone to Mr. Baldwin and I pitched him my idea and he told me to go ahead and run with it. And that is how our mini boat program was born. What we wanted to do was we wanted to connect students on both sides of the Pacific Ocean before the boats even hit the water so they could learn about each other's cultures and share their predictions about the ocean and weather patterns. So the reason we chose Japan actually comes from a really terrible tragedy in 2011, when an earthquake followed by a tsunami ravaged the east coast of Japan. About two years later, some of that debris from that tsunami started washing up on the shores of Oregon and Washington, including this vessel right here, the Saisho Maru, which currently lives at the Columbia River Maritime. It is actually in the same maritime hall that I am standing in right now. As well as the Saisho Maru, the abalone fishing boat, this thing washed up on the beach in Gearhart. And it turns out this is called a Kasagi. It's the top of a Tori gate, which is a Shinto shrine. And the people at the Portland Japanese Garden track down where this exactly came from. And that is where we partner up with our mini boat schools in Japan. Our first mini boat was launched in 2017 on November 4th. On Thanksgiving Day that year, we traveled to Hachinohe, Japan, pictured here with the class. We are sitting below that very same Kasagi that washed up in Gearhart and was returned to Hachinohe. So what we really wanted to do was recreate those voyages um, that came from disaster, but recreate them by bringing in positive experiences and helping students connect with each other across the ocean. And to this day, we have launched 27 mini boats that are out plying the Pacific Ocean. And today will be our first over mini boat float. Um, so that is really the program for today. But I wanted to sort of outline the river journey compared to our ocean journey. So what we're gonna do today is the mini boat is gonna splash down right in the port of Vancouver, and she's gonna sail under the I-5 bridge, past the confluence of the Lem and around Salvi Island, waving to the students at Columbia City Elementary School, under the Lewis and Clark Bridge, past Longview, around Puget Island and the ferry at Kalamath, and then all the way, hopefully, right in front of the Columbia River Maritime Museum, where we will go out, retrieve the mini boat, put the sail back on, and send her out into the Pacific Ocean for what I know is going to be a magical, amazing journey that will hopefully end in Japan. So that is sort of our mini boat journey. And at this time, I would like to kick it out to Mr. Bokin, who is out on the mighty Columbia River aboard He's the Shaver tugboat, the Cruiser. Mr. Bokin, are you there? I am there. I am here on the Columbia River. It is a beautiful day. We can see Mount Hood. We can see the airplanes taking off from PDX and from Pearson Airfield. Um, we're right just offshore from the Kaiser Shipyard Memorial. Uh, we are looking at the Liberty Ship launching platforms from World War II, seeing lots of people out on the river, enjoying this beautiful day. That's great. You seen any wildlife out there? Uh, not yet. Uh, I have actually been looking, saw a few sticks. Well, good. Well, you, you got to be careful of those sea lions, you know, that they don't you know, start messing with that Liberty boat as it sails up the Columbia River. Hopefully not. Uh, we are probably more concerned right now that the drone doesn't get attacked by a seal or a sea lion or, uh, or a bird. I'm looking at uh, McKay Spazito's uh, 
UAV. They're doing some filming of the launch from the drone. So it's uh, right up in the sky right now. That's great. And how, how's the current running in the Columbia? So we're right about tide change. Is she uh, flowing in the correct direction, which is towards Astoria right now? Because with so, the tides, you know, the Columbia River actually changes direction twice a day. Yeah, we're excited about it. Uh, when we were getting on the tug, our, uh, our boat captain, Brad, was letting us know that there is a really strong current right now. So uh, we have a really good chance of having a lot of success. Hey, well, that's, that's really, really great. Does he, do you know uh, what the temperature of the water is? Is it good enough to go not, for a swim today? I, I do not know what the temperature of the water is. But, uh, you know, if I stick my hand in the water right now real quick, see if I can get down there. Ouch, that's cold. So, you know, Nate, our original plan, we were trying to figure out how to get the boat back to you in Astoria to outfit it for launching was that I was going to swim the boat out into the middle of the Columbia. And after feeling that water right now, I don't think that would have been such a good idea. What do you think? I don't think so. I think, you know, you would have got a little bit of hypothermia, which is not good for uh, school teachers or anybody in general, to be honest. No, not at all. So, uh, Mr. Boken, um, why, why don't we have the sail on the mini boat? It's a good question, Nate. And a lot of people have been asking us about that even today. So if we were to put the sail on the mini boat, the sail does a great job of capturing the wind, transferring that wind energy into kinetic energy and pulling that boat uh, along uh, the water. But it would, on the river here, would probably pull the boat towards the shore. So we are trying to take the power of the currents, that high and uh, not so much the, the low tide, but the change from the high tide to the low tide as the current is pulling out towards the Pacific so that the boat can get carried out to you in Astoria. That's great. Well, I want to encourage anybody who's listening and watching to also put their comments in the, put their questions in the comments bar, and we'll make sure to get them relayed to either myself or Mr. Boken, or especially our student experts. So I'm going to actually kick off the questions while we have a minute here. We had talked about, you know, the seals and sea lions maybe, you know, messing with the mini boat in the Columbia River. Mr. Boken, do you know how to tell the difference between a seal or a sea lion? So as a science teacher, I probably should know, but I'm going to have to kick that to you to answer that question, Nate. Sure. Well, all you got to do is ask them. <laughs> and if it's a seal, it doesn't have ears, so it won't be able to hear you. But if it's a sea lion, it has little ear flaps, so it should be able to hear you pretty good. That's good to know. Perfect. Well, uh, I am so excited to see this Liberty being put in the river, but I have another quick question for you, Mr. Boken. If some, I mean, forget about the seals and sea lions. What if a fisherman or somebody out there in the river comes across our mini boat? How do we let them know what's happening? So that's a, another great question. So here we have uh, the mini boat SB Liberty and on the deck of the mini boat, there's some information that our students are going to talk with about later. Should, uh, should the boat get pulled up in another country where they speak and read a different language? But uh, zip tied up onto the mast there, there is a note that says, please leave me in the water um, unless you find that the boat is in trouble. And then they are going to contact you, Nate, and let you know where it's landed. But of course, Nate, you already will know where it's landed, right? That's right. I have real-time GPS information on the mini boat Liberty. And what's going to be really cool is that awesome animation that we saw about the mini boat's journey. We're going to be updating that every single week so that everybody can follow along on our Facebook page about where the boat currently is. But you can also go to the CRMM webpage, click on mini boats, and there'll be a map that will let you see where the Liberty is every single hour until she reaches Astoria. Now, Mr. Bokin, do you have a prediction about when the Liberty is gonna make it to Astoria? Yes, I think it's gonna take exactly 13, sorry, 30 days, 50, uh, 30 high tides and 30 low tides. Wow, all right. Well, I am guessing 17 days and we're going to check in with our students and we'll ask them during their interview section. 
And we would love people in the comments section to give your guess. When do you think the Liberty dropping in in just a few minutes in Vancouver, Washington, when is it going to reach Astoria? And then also, how many of you think it's going to end up stuck on an island? Mr. Boken, what do you think about those islands? There's, on that boat journey, there was quite a lot of islands as many boats going to have to navigate through the Columbia. Yeah, well, uh, the Liberty, she is a sturdy sailing vessel, and I really feel like she's going to steer herself in the current around those islands. Um, you know, she might pick up a couple of bird passengers. As I'm looking out on the river here right now, I just saw a goal landing uh, on the river. So maybe she'll be transporting some of that uh, famous sea life, marine life, river life uh, out to you in Astoria. Well, that's excellent. And you know, if any birds happen to do a dropping on our mini boat, you know what that means? Oh, I don't, but I bet that's it's good. It's good luck. It's very, very good luck. So uh, just hope you're not undercover there as well. Uh-oh. So, Mr. Boken, uh, who, who else do you have on the, on the cruiser with you today? So on the cruiser today, we have Rob Ritz, who is talking with a couple people from the Port of Vancouver right now. We also have our, our Captain Brad and our cameraman. Everybody's out here just enjoying the sun. So Rob Rich is the CEO of Saver Transportation. He is going to be helping me to uh, launch the mini boat into the river. Perfect. Well, I am really, really excited to come back here and watch this mini boat get put into the Columbia River. Are you getting about ready to get that boat in the river, Mr. Boken? We are getting ready. We had a little chat with the sheriff's department earlier. Uh, they were curious. They wanted to know what was going on so that when they started getting calls about an unmanned kayak going down the Columbia, they would know uh, where to send those messages and what to say about it. Perfect. So, Mr. Boken, we talked about the mini boats, five feet long, five feet tall. She weighs about 40 pounds, but where is most of that weight in the mini boat? Most of the weight is right here in the keel. So we have a department of students who worked on making the keel specifically. They had to weight that to exact uh, measurements. Uh, if I'm remembering correctly, that's 17 and a half pounds. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. And so- All right, well, Mr. Boken. Yep. Why don't we go ahead and start getting that boat prepared and put it in the water and then okay. we can go back and talk about some of the actual jobs that your students did to complete this system. Sounds good. So I have to unplug from the camera so you won't hear me anymore. We're going to go from the audio from the camera. And uh, Mr. Rich and I are going to head out to the end of the boat, Rob, uh, and launch the mini boat. All right. Fair wind. Drop. Drop. Oh, wow. This is exciting stuff. Our very first non-sailed mini boat in the Columbia River. And just like any mini boat launch in the ocean, in a river, anywhere, it's always what's the best, safest way to get that mini boat in the water so that you also don't end up in the water with the mini boat. Perfect. And don't forget, if any of you have any questions out there about the mini boat program, about maybe how your school could be involved in the mini boat program next year, any questions from Mr. Boken or our students, please put those right in the comment bar and we'll answer them as soon as we can. And there she is. Right there. Oh, she's really cruising there. Thumbs up, thumbs up. Look at that. Give him a thumbs up. Awesome. All right, folks. Well, 
I love watching a mini boat float more than anybody. But we're going to kick back to Mr. Boken in a little bit, and we'll check in on the progress of the mini boat. All right, folks, so let's talk a little bit about what the students, because this program is all about our students, is what do they actually do in this mini boat program? So what I think is really special about the mini boat program here at the Columbia River Maritime Museum is that this is 100% student-led. And I tell the students on the very first day that this project is up to you and your department working together with all of the other departments to solve problems, make new discoveries, and to push yourself. And I tell you, a mini boat is a system, and all of these departments have to come together to complete that system to make the mini boat's journey successful. And we don't tell the kids or the students where they're going to be and what they're going to do. What we do is we lay out what all the different jobs are and the students choose where they think they have the skill sets to be the best in their class or maybe what department do they wanna to join to learn a new set of skills. So the very first department we have is called the hull department. And just like it sounds, they're in charge of the body or the hull of the mini boat. So they're standing off the gel coat fiberglass, they're putting on anti-fouling paint and primer, and they're designing the entire paint scheme of the mini boat. Then we have the deck department. And again, just like the hull department, the deck department gets their hands really dirty, working with paints and epoxies. And what the deck department does is they create artwork that then gets adhered to the deck of the mini boat. Get this, the same way they put art on the deck of surfboards. We use that same technique. We print on rice paper. We use a nice epoxy coating and it becomes a glass-like covering to keep that artwork. And also, like Mr. Boken said earlier, the instructions about what to do if somebody finds that boat. So again, our deck department, lots of planning, lots of art, and lots of messes. Then we have our keel department. This are our real engineers. So the keel is just a bare shell of fiberglass and it needs to be weighted to 13 and a half pounds for a 40 pound mini boat. And the way those students achieve that is they mix up resin and a hardener. And then, and by the way, in very exact measurements, and then they fill up that keel with that sand mixture like you see in the photo here and get that to the exact weight. If a mini boat's keel is not weighted perfectly and a wave flips it upside down, that mini boat won't self right. And if the mini boat's upside down, not only is it not sailing, it's GPS and it's solar panel can't connect. And then we, we don't know where the mini boat is. So the best success of our mini boats that are traveling and still sailing today, is because that keel department engineered it perfectly. And then we have our sail department. These are for our artists and these are exact artists. They take the entire eight week process to create the sail, but they only get to paint on one side of the sail. On the boat launched from the United States, our students design and do the art on the front of the sail. On the boat that is launched from Japan, our students design the art that goes on the back of the sail. And then when I go to Japan, I bring both sails with me and the Japanese students do the same, which is really amazing as every mini boat has art in a piece from students from both countries. And then we have our social media team, especially in today's world, how everybody wants to know about the mini boats and what they're up to. So we have our very own CRMM mini boat Facebook page, which I hope a lot of you are watching from right now. And you can see pictured here is our great social media, Danielle, and she's out there. She made some really amazing videos, which you can actually see on our Facebook page after this broadcast is over. And then we have our digital media team. So these students are creating newsletters and correspondence and international relations with our partners in Japan. So again, there are jobs for people who want to get really messy and work with cool chemicals and paints and wear face masks, although these days we're all wearing face masks. But there is a spot for just about every single student, including our VIP and media relations students. They do all of our interviews. They personally take around 
senators, and this is the Japanese council, and they take them and teach them all about the mini bowl program. Again, we're trying to fold in the entire community to be part of this program. And it starts with the kids because they handle every single aspect. No adult tells them what to do. Every decision is made by them. And then finally, what is a good system team if you're not documenting what you're doing and making really cool videos? And that would be our documentary team. But what I like to think of is they're all very important teams. But the quartermasters, I told them from the beginning, they're sort of like the boss or the glue that holds the entire mini boat program together in their class. And pictured on this slide and joining us right now is the amazing Brooklyn from Y East Middle School. Hey, Brooklyn, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Hey, how's it going? Um, I'm doing pretty good. How are you? Oh, I'm excellent. I'm really excited that you are here joining us today. And so, Brooklyn, I said that you were the quartermaster and you were sort of in charge of a lot of things. But could you tell me what was the function or the job of your department? Well, um, as a quartermaster, my department was responsible for observing and reporting the weather patterns, wind patterns and water currents across the Pacific Ocean. We were also responsible for the written translations that were put on the deck of the boat. Perfect. Now, um, how did you decide what languages to translate the instructions to? Um, well, we were um, recording and observing the water currents um, and in different seasons, we recorded the wind patterns. And so we could figure out which uh, islands it would most likely land on. And then we had to figure out which languages they spoke, which was very difficult because Perfect. So once you found out that what languages you were going to translate the finder's instructions on the mini boat, how did you actually do those translations? I mean, I would just guess that you don't speak French, for example. No, I do not speak French. Um, we were thinking about using Google Translate at first, but then we were like, Google Translate isn't very accurate. So we had to to different websites to figure out um, which languages it was. And then we had to connect to people that our peers knew to make them or to have them check the translations to make sure they were correct. Absolutely. And you know, Brooklyn, that is so great thing about your class is you are the third year that we have done this mini boat program. So each year that we do this, we learn something new that then I try to bring and share with the next year's mini boat students. And one really important lesson we learned about translations from our first year is we were just using Google Translate. And uh, one of the students said, you know, I actually know somebody who speaks this language. She's a, you know, my aunt speaks Thai. Can I bring this to her and have her read it? And I thought, well, you know, of course, there's always the students bringing up the great ideas. I said, absolutely. And he brought it back and laughed because his aunt said, our instruction said, when you find our mini boat, shoot it. And of course, we meant take a photograph of it. And so, Brooklyn, it is absolutely important that we had all of those translations checked by native speakers. Um, Brooklyn, your class boat that you built was launched on Thanksgiving Day in 2019, just this last Thanksgiving, off the coast of Hachinohe. What can you tell me about maybe some successful things about that voyage? Um, well, our boat actually crossed the international date line at just 77 days at sea, mid-February. And let me just tell you something, Brooklyn. Earlier this week, we had another mini boat launch from Japan that crossed the international date line. It only took that boat 500 and some days to cross the international date line. So the boat that you built and your quartermastering got that boat on the perfect track to, I'm saying, break all sorts of mini boat records. So right now that boat is just a little bit northwest of Hawaii. Do you think that that mini boat is going to make it to the shores of North America this year, Brooklyn? Um, I'm predicting it will make it around late December to early January. Um, I do not think that it will hit Hawaii, though. <laughs> kind of unlucky for Mr. Boking, because I know he wants to travel there. 
I know. I think, you know, we'll just uh, take, we'll take the cruiser on over there. So um, Brooklyn, I think that's a really great guess. I hope that that mini boat comes ashore, hopefully in Oregon or Washington in 2020. But when that boat comes ashore, I'm going to grab it. I'm going to find all of you Y East middle school students who then be in eighth grade. And what are we going to do? What, what do you want to know about that mini boat that you launched on Thanksgiving? I really want to see the condition that the boat is in. And I'm very excited to open up the cargo hatch to see what the Japanese students in Hachinohe decided to give us. And I'm not going to tell you what's in that cargo hold, but I know because I saw them pack it up. And there's some pretty cool things in there that I think you all will really like. So Brooklyn, um, can you tell me what is, what's the mini boat program? How is it valuable for you as a student? I mean, I, I don't know, maybe you do want to be a sailboat captain or, but how, how does it valuable to your life with what you're interested in, which may not be maritime things, but hopefully we convince you that being maritime things is pretty cool. Um, well, I found that the mini boat program is very valuable to uh, students because they learn how to work as teams and uh, connect with other people and they can also, it's a very hands-on program and the students get to be in charge and that's very good. Um, I'm also thinking about going to the Coast Guard. So I'm happy that I got to experience all this. Hey, um, that is amazing that you wanna go into the Coast Guard. Let's uh, connect a little bit after this and we'll see if we can get some, some good mentors for you. I know a lot of really cool women in the US Coast Guard and they can tell you all about all the different jobs. Brooklyn, that kind of just made my day. I like that, thank you. No well, Brooklyn, we're going to check back with you in a little bit because I'm sure some people have some questions for you. But we're going to go to our next student, which is Sean. Hey, Sean, are you on the line? Yes. Hey, Sean. So, Sean, what department were you a part of? It's one we haven't talked about. I was part of the CT department responsible for the GPS, the hatch, and then the cargo. Perfect. Yeah. So CT department stands for cargo tracking. And uh, what, what kind of cargo did you put in your mini boat? Uh, well, my group put in it was a whole bunch of toys and some stuffed animals for the students in Japan to enjoy. Perfect. So how many people were part of your cargo tracking department, Sean? Uh, we only had four and I'm pretty four. sure now, yeah, so I gave you a budget of $50, and I said you can put whatever you want inside the cargo hold of this mini boat. Did your department have any disagreements about what sort of things you wanted to put in that cargo hold? Yeah, we had a lot of disagreements because some things that one person wanted was about the size of the entire hatch or bigger, and then it was way out of budget, like 20 bucks. Perfect. Now, did you guys think about how much things weighed or... If they, you know, one of our mini boats, they had saltwater taffy as their cargo. And a year and a half later, when we opened it up, uh, it knocked your socks off. It smelled so bad. So did you guys have any considerations about weight or what sort of things might hold up in the cargo hold? Um, we didn't have anything about weight. The only thing uh, we really were worried about was price, um, how it would hold up, how long it would last, and the size of it. Perfect. Well, if you remember, Sean, we were talking earlier uh, when I was speaking with Brooklyn about how you've really benefited from being the third year doing this program. And we've learned a lot of things. One of them we've learned from our first year is that you just don't lightly attach the GPS unit with a little bit of epoxy to the cargo hold because it will fall off and get smashed into a million pieces. And then we don't know where our boat is anymore. So what did you do to make sure that that GPS unit stayed secure in that cargo hold? Well, we did this year was we on the bottom of the hatch, we had some hard foam epoxy to it, and then we had mounts to put the GPS and screw the mounts on so it wouldn't fall out. Hey, that sounds like a pretty good idea. And we'll just say that all the mini boats this year, that seems to be working pretty good because they are all still reporting really, really well. Um, one other question I have is, I've noticed that on your mini boat that the cargo hatch is painted white. Uh, why did you paint the cargo hatch cover white? 
Oh, we decided to paint it white so no sun would shine through the transparent lid and then create moisture damaging everything inside. That sounds like a, a pretty smart, smart choice. And uh, one question, what kind of failures did you guys have? Because one of the things I love about Mr. Boken's class is that whenever somebody in your class fails, everybody stands up and cheers. Woohoo! So you celebrate failure. We learn best by failing and then trying again and trying again. Uh, what kind of failures did either your department or your class have? Um, I'm not too sure if the class had any failures that I can remember, but our group had a lot of failures with agreeing with each other of what we wanted and how we were going to mount it. Absolutely. And Sean, did uh, Mr. Boken or myself ever come in the middle of you and say, all right, stop arguing. Here's what you're going to do. Did we ever do that to you? Um, I think only once because some of us weren't listening to each other. <laughs> that happens. And the final question I have for you, Sean, is how the only decision your class got to make as a whole was the name of that mini boat Liberty. Um, why did you choose, why did your class choose the name Liberty for your mini boat? Um, we chose the name Liberty because it stands strong of the United States and something that every nation should need. I love it. And what's really poetic about the relaunch hashtag Liberty second chance is that it's going to be relaunched in the Columbia river in view of those very skids that those Liberty ships skidded down into the Columbia river. And you may not know, but once those ships were built in Vancouver, those Liberty ships, they would float them to Astoria to Tongue Point where they would outfit them and finish off those vessels. So we're actually recreating a real Liberty ships adventure on the Columbia river, just like in the 1940s. All right. Well, I think we are ready for some questions for our students. Do we have any questions on the line? I'm looking here. I'm not seeing if I see any. Well, I'm going to start off by asking a question first to Brooklyn. Brooklyn, what was the best part of the mini boat program for you? So I would come into your school every single Monday. And what would you look forward to, to my visit? Besides, you know, me coming in is pretty awesome. Uh, what sort of things with your team and your class, how is it different from an average day? Um, it was different from an average day because I was excited to do new things and things that I didn't know how to do, but I was excited to figure it out. Um, all the days, all the Mondays that you came in were always really fun for all of our classes. I'll tell you, Monday was one of the best days of my, we actually, Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, because those are the three days I got to go to school and do mini boats and hang out with you awesome students. All right, I think we're going to go out to the Columbia River and check in with Mr. Boken, who I believe is with Mr. Rob Rich from Shaver Transportation. Hi there, Rob Rich from Shaver Transportation here. We got you loud and clear. Hey, Mr. Rich, how you doing out there today? Oh, pretty good. It's a beautiful day out in the Columbia. We're fortunate uh, to have good weather and uh, not much in the way of wind. A, a great day for launching the Liberty off of uh, off the Vancouver shipyard. Perfect. Well, I want to first say thank you so much for uh, giving up one of your tugboats for the day to help us with this incredible journey. And I wanted to share with you that I love tugboats. I'm a tugboat nerd. And I am really jealous that Mr. Boken is out there on the cruiser. Uh, Mr. Rich, I am such a tugboat nerd. I have my very own shaver stuffed tugboat that lives on the desk of my office. That is what a big <laughs> fan I am. And oh, I was hoping you could answer. <laughs> I was hoping you could answer the most important question. What is a tugboat and what is a towboat? Oh, that is such a good question. All right. Any, anything that is in the realm of uh, service producing high horsepower vessel that moves barges and moves ships would be called a tugboat. So whether it's pulling or pushing, it'll be a tugboat. 
the term towboat is often used in referring to a tugboat that is towing a barge on a tow line. You do that out in the ocean. You don't usually do much tow line work on the river. If you do, there's usually an assist boat behind. But that being said, the term towboat and tugboat actually pretty uh, pretty interchangeable. Well, that's great. Well, I have a question for you. Here at the mouth of the Columbia River, a lot of times we see tugboats that are pulling barges and then they drop their barge at anchor and then a different tugboat comes and then starts pushing that very same barge. So why in the ocean would you tow a barge and in the river push a barge? Great question. Okay, out in the ocean, you have high swells, you have a lot of wind and waves. The barge is going to be anywhere from eight to say 12,000 tons. The tugboat, although it's very heavy, might only be three, four, 500 tons. So if you can imagine, the waves are going to make the tugboat operate like this and the barge like this. So with a 2,000 foot tow line in between, the tow line acts, excuse me, tow line acts like a big shock absorber called a catenary between the tug and the barge back here. You do not want to have the tug hooked up to the barge out in the ocean. So once they come into the Columbia River and anchor, then a river tug with uh, the ability to hook up solid, hooks up to the barge, kind of like a, a big outboard motor on the back of the barge, and pushes it up river. You have much better control for steerage as well as for start and stop. Uh, you can't do that out in the ocean, but you can do it in the river. Hey, well, that kind of explains a lot. I appreciate it. Uh, another thing, where I first fell in love with tugboats were these kind of cool, these tractor tugs that do the ship assist. So... Yeah. Can just one of those tractor tugs actually push a, a ship into the dock or pull it off of the dock? Well, physically... Or do they need to one, work in teams? Yeah, physically, one tug, depending on its horsepower, has the capability to do that. But the river pilots generally prefer two tugs, one at the bow, one at the stern, so there's always control of the ship. But when it's coming up the river and getting near the dock, that's one thing, but we're and it's alongside the dock trying to go to the dock itself, they really prefer two tugs to be able to push the ship sideways because the ship can't do that. So is there a lot of uh, special communication that has to happen? I'm just thinking about our students in their departments, how oh, yeah. they, you know, they have to work together to do the same things, but they're doing different things. It's, how does that communication work between those tugboats? Oh, well, it's actually excellent. The, the radio that the ship has, we have the same type of radios on the tugs, so both of the ship assist tugs are in communication with either the bar pilot that's bringing the ship across the Columbia River bar into Astoria or the river pilot that gets on with Astoria and brings it up river. So they're in communication, the, the pilot on the ship, many of them have already been a tugboat captain themselves. So they not only know the tugs, but the people they're working with. And so they tell them, you know, one tug get on the stern, one tug on the bow. And then that pilot is telling them, you know, push easy, pull easy, Pull, pull hard. He's giving all those directions over the radio. So they're talking back and forth, just like we are right now, you know, giving a direction, the tugboat captain saying, uh, yes, sir, backing half, you know, whatever the order is the pilot gave, the tugboat captain responds so that they both know they're in communication. Hey, that's, that's really great. Now, how would a ship know, like if, if, a, if I'm a captain of a ship and I need to get a tugboat, Besides putting up my Z signal flag, um, how do I arrange? I mean, I would assume there's a lot of different tugboats out there. How does that coordination work? Well, the, uh, the agent, who is the person that represents the vessel owner's uh, interests here in the river, because the vessel owners are from all over the world. They're obviously not here. The local steamship agent makes arrangements with the tug company two or three days or more in advance of a ship's arrival. So the tug companies know long in advance and with the, the uh, advanced communications and AIS that there is for tracking ships these days, it isn't really too hard any longer to electronically stay on top of where a ship is or when it's going to be here. And once it gets into the river, we're in continuous communication with the river pilot as well as the vessel agent and such to know when the tugs are supposed to be alongside and help them in. So there's actually quite a bit of notice and it's pretty much predetermined a uh, day or two or three before the ship even arrives here at the Columbia River. 
Well, great. Well, if, if I got a job with Shaver Transportation, which would be, you know, the second best job in the world after education director at the Maritime Museum, um, some of those tugboats go all the way up the Columbia River. And are those crews living on board for like a week or two at a time? You bet they are. In fact, while we were out launching today, we had two barge tows come by uh, with, with Snake River wheat on board. So those barge tows would have traveled to the four Columbia River locks the four locks on the lower Snake River, uh, all the way as far east as Lewiston, Idaho. And yes, you're right. It's about a week round trip. Two captains, two deckhands are on board for seven days. And they uh, pick up the barge tow here in Portland, take it all the way up river, drop it off along the way. There are 26 river elevators between here and Lewiston, Idaho to load that wheat. And then they pick up their barges on the way down and bring them back to the harbor here. Portland, Vancouver, Kalama, and Longview for offload. And, and yes, some of the tug companies on the river actually do work two weeks on, two weeks off. So definitely a good schedule there. Well, how's the food? Oh, you know, a lot of them will tell you that's the best part of the job. They eat, uh, eat pretty well. I'll just put it that way. Very good. Perfect. Well, I got one final question for you. So you if I wanted to be at the helm of a shaver tugboat, cruising up river, pushing a full four barges up river, just being the boss of the river. How, how do I become that? If, if I'm in high school or middle school, how, how do I achieve that goal? First and foremost, number one, graduate from high school. That's a big number one, graduate from high school. Number two, always be focused on further education. You do not have to have a maritime background to be a crew member. You do not have to go to a maritime college, although there are maritime colleges. There's maritime courses right there in Astoria. But getting an education to show your employer that you can learn because there's so much to learn, to be a deckhand on a tug, to be a tugboat captain, to operate all the electronics. There's so much learning. That's what we and anybody else in the tugboat industry is looking for is somebody with an aptitude to learn. Again, you do not have to know maritime You have to be able to learn. If you can demonstrate that to an employer, you can become a deckhand. And after about seven or eight years of time aboard the boat, you can start to become a captain on the Columbia River. It's a great job, a great career. And uh, boy, what a great question that you have the opportunity to share that. Get your education. Hey, well, I love to hear that. And I just love your passion for tugboats. And thank you so much. We're going to kick it over to Alisa from Pacific Power, who I think might have some questions from the audience. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, we really appreciated hearing about the maritime um, industry and different career opportunities. So thanks so much to Shaver Transportation. And thank you, Nate. Um, yes, it looks like we do have a few questions. So I'm actually going to kick this first question over to Sean. So Sean, you better be paying attention here. Um, I know we're in distance learning still. Um, but here's a question for you. So you were on the cargo and technology team. I We've got a question here that um, is interested, how did you pick that team and what was the coolest part of what you learned about being on the cargo technology team? So Sean, take it away. Uh, the reason why I chose that I chose that team is because that's the one that most piqued my, piqued my interest for being a little hands-on and working with some people I know. So as part of that uh, cargo technology team, um, what, what, which part of the technology piqued your interest? I know that there's a GPS. Could you tell me a little bit more about how um, that GPS was mounted? Because I know if you don't mount it correctly, it could, as the ocean kind of goes along, it's going to wishy-washy. And, and how exactly did you mount that technology so that it would appropriately tell us where your mini boat is? Um, so what we did is we put the GPS on the hatch, on the bottom of the hatch, traced it, and then we put the um, we put the foam and then epoxied it so it would fit exactly and it would barely move. Great. Thank you so much, Sean. Um, so Brooklyn, this one is actually for you. Um, as part of quartermastering, um, what about that particular team was appealing to you and what was the coolest thing you learned about ocean currents? Well, what was appealing to me was I've always liked um, learning about weather and water currents 
um, I really like the water. It's just very, very cool to me. So that's what really piqued my interest. I also like that it was kind of just like secretly the boss of the entire thing. <laughs> nice. That's great. Um, so Nate, I have one here for you. So what is sure. the farthest of any of the mini boats? Have any of them made it to Japan? No, they have not. Um, and actually the furthest sailing that one of our mini boats has done is actually the boat that crossed the international date line just two days ago, the Go Go Okuki Go built by the students at Gearhart Elementary. She sailed over, I believe, 15,000 nautical miles. But most of those nautical miles have been in circles in the middle of the Pacific Ocean where she finally kicked off. We've also had a boat called the Nishikaze. She sailed about 11,000 nautical miles until she washed up on a little tiny atoll in the Republic of Kiribati, which is in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So Nate, tell us what happens when a boat gets stuck. Well, I make a promise to our mini boat students at the beginning of the year that if they work together and complete this project and we get it out to sea, if that boat crashes, I will do everything in my power, even if that means I have to physically travel there to rescue their mini boat and get it put back out to sea. So some of the, the most exciting times for me is when a mini boat is sailing close to shore and you're thinking, is the weather going to turn and push it ashore? Are we going to have to formulate a rescue mission or is it going to kick back out to sea? And I can tell you what, those are the most exciting times for the students because that's when you really got to pay attention to those weather patterns and figure out where that boat's going to land. And hopefully it doesn't smash into the rocks. Great. Thank you. Uh, so Mr. Boken, we actually have a question for you. Um, this is a really unique classroom program and we are curious, um, what was the most special thing from your perspective as an educator about this program for your students? Yeah. Uh, so that is, uh, Gosh, what a great question. And there are so many aspects of this program that, that's amazing. And I think the, the thing that hits me the most with our students at Y East is that for, for many of them, they're not gonna have an opportunity to interact with and work with students from another country. To, um, to have that is, is amazing. Um, and then to get their first shot at being part of each of these different departments. So being involved with all aspects of this particular program really gives the students a great opportunity to um, engage in careers, uh, engage in different kinds of science. So um, that's what's been the, the best for me is knowing that it's been so, so intrinsically rewarding for the students. Absolutely. Um... Here at Pacific Power, we couldn't agree more. This program just has so many wonderful facets for students um, building those skills for their future. Um, so we're actually gonna kick it back over to Brooklyn for this question. Um, so you weren't on the international relations team, but could you tell me a little bit more about the Japanese connection and your um, interaction with the students in Japan? Well, Nate actually gave us a few projects where we had to um, connect with the principal of the school in Hachinohe. And so we got to uh, send letters and emails to them. And it was really cool to be able to have that connection so far. And kind of a follow on to that, are you guys still um, connected? Do you continue? Is there, do you have a, a group that you connect with on a regular basis? Either. You know, Sean, why don't you answer that one? Are you guys still connected to Japan? Um, in my opinion, I think we are in case the mini boat ever comes back or theirs reaches our shores, we can tell them that we got it. Great, thanks. Um, so Nate, I actually have another one for you. So going back to when these mini boats are close to shore and you can see it, it's gonna be, it's close. Is it going to hit somewhere? Where is the coolest place that you had to travel to rescue a mini boat? And I know you have a story for this one, so I can't wait for you to answer this question. Yeah, well, I think the coolest place that I've, I got to go was in Kiribati. Um, again, it is the 
third least visited country in the world. It took me two days of flying to get there. And when we got there, we didn't even know where the mini boat was because the GPS had been smashed and wasn't transmitting. So the quartermasters obviously did an excellent job because we got an email in some broken English from somebody whose brother's friend found the boat in a little tiny village. So when we flew there, we had three days and uh, a local man, he hired our boat out and he took us across uh, across the lagoon to this little tiny village and they didn't speak any English. So I just put up a little photo of the mini boat and they laughed and they pointed and they say, follow me. And we walked for about 10 minutes and around a bend, there was the mini boat sitting under a banana leaf hut. It was the most amazing thing. Um, not only in my professional career, but, uh, you know, besides uh, the birth of my child, that's about, you know, the second or third coolest thing that's ever happened in my life. So absolutely. I've had the pleasure of uh, hearing that story before. Is there, is, if somebody wanted to hear more about that story, is there a place that they could go to learn more? Absolutely. So um, I wrote an article that was published in the museum's quarterly um, newsletter called The Quarter Deck, but also uh, that was republished in Northwest Yachting Magazine. So you can just go on a Google search, Northwest Yachting Magazine, mini boats, and you can read that firsthand account. Great. Thank you. And for all of you, um, it's worth a read. Um, he went on an epic adventure to rescue one of these mini boats and set it back out to sea. Um, well, that is all the time we have for questions. Thank you very much if you submitted one. We're so happy that you were here uh, tuning into this adventure with us. Uh, we want to thank Nate and the Columbia River Maritime Museum, our student shipbuilders. Thank you all for participating. Shaver Transportation, absolutely, for uh, helping us with this relaunch of our mini boat. We can't wait to watch it sail from Vancouver all the way over to Astoria. And guess what? You have two more opportunities to learn a little bit more about this program. You have opportunity uh, next Friday, which is June 5th from tw 12 to 1 to hear There She Blows, in which we're going to hear more about wind and ocean currents. Um, and we'll also be checking in on the mini boats progress. And then the Friday following, which is Friday, June 12th, also from 12 to 1, we'll be talking about the mighty Columbia. Um, we'll be talking about what's a working river. What does that mean and what does this river um, contribute to our region and our communities? So thank you very much everybody for participating. Um, and if you'd like to learn a little bit more about the program or you'd like to track those mini boats, um, go to the CRMM mini boat program Facebook page and that will help you um, get connected in where you can follow the mini boats journey. So thank you very much, everyone. This is Elisa from Pacific Power signing off. See you next time.